Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 310th episode, we have our third day of SVP, which again is different than everybody else's since it was asynchronous. But for us, that means the Romer Prize, the Taphonomy Session, and the Education and Outreach Sessions. And then next week, we're going to wrap up with a whole bunch of miscellaneous categories that included some dinosaur talks. I don't know why I originally thought we could finish this in three episodes, since it usually takes us four, and we covered more talks this year because we were from home. But anyway, I guess I was just being ambitious, but it is going to take four weeks as usual. In addition to those news items, we also have some other dinosaur news from around the world, and we have our dinosaur of the day, Hypsellosaurus. And then for our fun fact, I have some details on how clarity works. You had to clarify clarity? I did, yeah. <laughs> But before we get into all that, really quickly, we want to thank some of our patrons for helping to keep our podcast running. We don't have any new patrons this week, so if you want a shout out, please consider joining. But from our existing patrons, we'd like to thank TRX Dinosaurs, Robert, Laurasaurus, Dino Mo, James Pasco, Jackson Crawford, Vikram and Karthik, Melina and Manoli, Diplodicate, and Mayu. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate all of your support. And we mentioned in the past, it's because of your support that we're able to cover conferences like SVP. So we appreciate you. And if you want to join our growing community and get in on some of our rewards, then check out our page at patreon.com slash I know Dino. So speaking of those SVP talks that we were able to cover, thanks to our patrons. Jumping right in, we have our first Romer Prize eligible talk. Those are selected by the Romer Prize committee, I guess. They go through all the SVP abstracts and they pick out basically the ones that they think are the best talks. They put them in one session and then from those, based on what they learned in the talk and how impactful they think it is and how good the presentation is, I guess, they pick a winner for like the best talk of all of SVP. So this is sort of the best of highlights from around SVP. And I'm going to focus on the dinosaur ones, obviously, which I think was at least half of the talks. So that shows you yep, dinosaurs are the best thing about SVP. Well, they're <laughs> at least heavily featured in SVP. Yeah, especially in the Romer Prize session. Up first, I'm going to start with the ankylosaur presentation because ankylosaurs are the best, obviously. I see. I'll get to some sauropodomorphs later. Don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) This one was presented by Thomas Raven, and it was all about how ankylosaurs evolved and diversified. So he pointed out that ankylosaurs are very diverse. They're known from the early Jurassic through the latest Cretaceous, which is a pretty wide range for a dinosaur group. Lots of other early groups didn't last all the way until the end of the Cretaceous. And other dinosaurs didn't even evolve in the first place until the Cretaceous. But ankylosaurs were around most of the time. They're also on every continent, including Antarctica, just like sauropodomorphs. And they studied 91 taxa, and two-thirds of them they observed in person, which is quite a sample to go through. The full group of ankylosaurs is at least when I say ankylosaurs, I'm talking about ankylosauria, which is basically everything with a tail club and without a tail club, everything that is a derived enough thyrea foran, that it's not a basal thyrea foran, and it's not a stegosaur. All of those other things fit in ankylosauria. And then ankylosauridae is the largest group within ankylosauria, and that's the group that started in the late Jurassic in Asia and stretches out through the end of the Cretaceous. And we have a good sample of that in North America, including Ankylosaurus. Most of those are the ones with tail clubs. And then usually the other group we talk about is Notosauridae. So there was Ankylosauridae and Notosauridae. And Notosauridae is the one without tail clubs. But unfortunately for Notosaurid fans, Raven didn't find any support for Notosauridae as a monophyletic group. Instead, it got split into three different groups. So it ended up being part of them in Struthiosauridae, which were largely in Europe. Then there's Edmontonidae from North America. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce that. I'm kind of going with Edmontonia and then putting day at the end, but it's named after Edmonton, so maybe it's Edmontonidae. Anyway, 
that's the second group. And then Polacanthidae is the third group, which is North America and Europe. So we end up with this crazy paraphyletic group of Notosauridae. There's also evidence of a lot of movement between Thyreophorans in different continents, including the earliest known members, which are in South America and Asia, even though at the time, South America and Asia were about as far apart on the Earth as you could get, much like they are today. So it's pretty weird. There must be some missing data in between, and we probably don't know exactly where the earliest ankylosaurs came from. We do have better evidence about where the latest ankylosaurs ended up, though, and it appears that they increased in diversity when stegosaurs went extinct, so they were probably filling in some niches that stegosaurs were occupying before. Make room for the tail clubs. Yeah. (laughs) They'll make room if you don't make room for them. (laughs) The Romer Prize Talks also had an accompanying Q&A session, which was really good. And for this one, there were a couple good questions. One of them was basically, what are the next steps for figuring out how these niches were formed? And Raven said that what he wants to look at is dental microware In other words, looking for niche partitioning in what specifically they might have been eating so that we can tell if stegosaurs and ankylosaurs were eating the same things because there's a hypothesis that stegosaurs were high browsers, which I think is kind of funny because stegosaurs clearly are not high browsers, (laughs) at least compared to something like a brachiosaurus or something. High for a thyreophoran. Yeah, I think that's the only thing it could be considered a high browser compared to, except for maybe some small mammals or something. But yeah, getting their head five feet or two meters off the ground compared with nose shoved in the dirt. There's also another point that came up in the Q&A, which was that Isabarisaura was probably a stegosaur, and that might point to a South American origin. But since there's that big lack of sampling in Gondwana, it's hard to say for sure where Thyreophorans came from. So I thought that was pretty exciting. It's a little bit cumbersome because now rather than just saying ankylosaurids and notosaurids i might have to say ankylosaurids edmontonids polacanthids and struthiosaurids which is a lot so i'll probably just say ankylosaurs and then refer to the ones with club tails or not club tails or something or the name of the dinosaur you're referring to yeah that that also works but it reminds me a little bit of the ornithocelida or ornithoscolida debate on whether it our traditional classifications of dinosaurs are actually valid because as we get more and more fossils the likelihood increases that our original assumptions could be disproven so this is just another element to that unfortunately that one did not win the romer prize even though i thought it would be a good contender for winning bias (laughs) yeah our next talk includes some sauropods in it you'll be happy to know oh good This one was presented by Martin Varnstrom, and they were looking at the dinosaur food web and how it changed during the Triassic and across the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, which is obviously a pivotal time for dinosaurs, since across that Triassic-Jurassic boundary seems to be when dinosaurs became the real dominant group of their ecosystems. So to examine this, they looked at sites in Poland There were three different sites. They had coprolites, regurgitolites, and bite marks. And together, you could call those bromolites, sort of the overarching term. In total, they had over 500 specimens, so pretty good sample set to work from. One of the first enjoyable facts that came out of this presentation was that the shape of a coprolite helps to define the animal that produced it. So if it's long and skinny versus if it's more round or if, because you know a little bit about its digestive tract shape. Yeah, exactly. So if they're spiraled too, that can tell you something pretty interesting and helpful bit of information. The next best way probably to figure out what it came from is by looking inside the coprolite. And the way you want to do that, if you can, is by using a really high power x-ray so that you can see inside it without disturbing it. Because then everything is still preserved in its original orientation, potentially in 3D. So what they did is they went to the European Synchrotron, my favorite x-ray, to see what was inside. I think it's the world's most powerful x-ray. It's pretty crazy. They scanned 80 specimens and other ones they thin sectioned. Some of them they did both and or analyzed chemically. So this is a really big sample set of different coprolites and other bromolites. 
What they found was that all three of the sites in the Triassic and at the boundary included both aquatic and terrestrial animals. The best specimen, I think, came from Silosaurus. They found insect and beetle remains inside it, including an amazing image of a beetle in three dimensions in a coprolite that was in such high quality, <laughs> such a good scan that you could see so many details on it, that it was good enough to name a new beetle species based only on the scan from inside a poop. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. They also found that these early dinosaurs, not surprisingly, were mostly eating insects and things like that. But by the middle, which was around the boundary, the bromelites contained about 50% bone, including broken teeth in the coprolites. And they found bite marks on the bone. So this may have been from something like smock feeding on some other archosaurs and fish. So probably still not dinosaurs eating a whole bunch of bone like T-Rex would eventually do. But by the Jurassic, they had coprolites that were up to a foot long and seemed to be from large and medium-sized theropods. So by that point, once we're through the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, it looks like, at least in Poland, dinosaurs were fully dominating that ecosystem. There also was an herbivore, which was probably an ornithischian-like dinosaur. And then there was another theropod, which was probably a smaller fish-eating animal. The herbivores had diverse plant material, including both small and medium-sized ornithischians, and then there were also some sauropods, as I promised. But he didn't talk much about them, so I can't tell you much about them, other than that they were there. <laughs> and they were probably the largest herbivores in the ecosystem by the beginning of the Jurassic. That tracks. The only thing that seemed to be eating them was meat-eating dinosaurs. It didn't look like there were other animals at the top of the food chain, at least on the carnivore side. So in general, it basically reaffirmed what we've been talking about all these years, which is it looks like dinosaurs first evolved in the Triassic, and then around that Triassic-Jurassic boundary is really when they took off and started to dominate the ecosystems. But this is Another really good piece of evidence is better than just saying, well, there were big dinosaurs starting in the early Jurassic. We can look at what they were actually eating and see that it seems to point to that shift in diet from insects and things like that, which are obviously much lower in the food chain to eating other dinosaurs. And while we're talking about early dinosaurs, I think it would be fun to throw in a talk which is related to early dinosaurs. It's all about how did early land animals walk and specifically, how did their limb bones need to change in order to switch from an aquatic lifestyle where their limbs were used as fins to a land lifestyle where the <laughs> fins are evolving into a leg or an arm, which is crazy, but it's something that happened. And just a quick reminder that tetrapods like us and dinosaurs and all mammals and all amphibians and just about everything that you see that has vertebrae evolved from lobe-finned fish. Modern examples of them are coelacanths, but coelacanths literally have bones in their fins, much like our arm bones and leg bones. So it's an exact analog. You can look in their fins and see their carpal bones just like our and our wrist and things like that. It's pretty weird. It is pretty weird. Other fish other than coelacanths are ray-finned fish, and they do not have these lobes they're more like keratin structures by comparison, and they wouldn't be able to evolve into something like a limb, or at least I can't imagine how it could happen. I shouldn't say it couldn't happen because life finds a way, as they say. <laughs> In this study, they were looking specifically at the humerus, and they, I should say, is Blake Dixon was the presenter. Most of this evolution from the sea to land happened during the Carboniferous. And during that time, you can see how the humerus, which is that upper arm bone, evolved to switch from that aquatic lifestyle to one that is better suited for land. The really interesting thing is they came up with the ideal limb bones and how they differ depending on what sort of environment you're in. And basically, if you want a really strong humerus, really strong upper arm, you want it to be short and wide, kind of square with some big points sticking off of it for large muscle attachment points, because that way you get the best leverage on the limb. 
And that's exactly what you see in these aquatic animals and the very early ones that were walking on land. But as the animals evolved more to walk on land, their limbs got longer, which gives you a better stride, but it gets a lot weaker. So actually, our humerus is much weaker than you'd see in a shorter humerus, but it obviously gives her a better stride, as, assuming we're walking quadrupedally. The same applies for femurs, I suppose. Fortunately for us, there's a way to compensate for this less ideal shape strength-wise, and that's to use more dense bone and put more energy into developing stronger bones, and then you can kind of compensate for that unideal shape, but the shape that's necessary if you want a longer stride or a longer reach. Make sure you get enough calcium. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> because our bones are not ideally shaped, so they need to stay strong. In the Q&A too, there was a good question talking about was using a 2D model good enough to represent all the differences that you see? And the answer was basically one characteristic that comes up is there's this twisted tetrahedron, also known as a twisted hourglass shape that is characteristic for quadrupedal animals. So if you see a more twisted hourglass shape, then you might be looking at a quadrupedal animal if all you have is the humerus. It's a fun little tidbit and something that might be useful with dinosaurs if we're trying to figure out if something was quadrupedal or bipedal. True. And speaking of that quadrupedal bipedal shift, there was a, another talk by Kimberly Chappelle, and they were talking about how sauropods evolved from small bipedal animals into the large sauropods like Brontosaurus that Sabrina loves. Mm -hmm. Those quadrupedal ones. Yep. With the twisted forearms. <laughs> exactly. Specifically for this talk, they focused on Massospondylus, which is one of the really interesting sauropods because it actually lived through the end Triassic extinction. So even though dinosaurs lived from the Triassic into the Jurassic, there was a big turnover in the animals. So we don't find a ton of the same exact species from before the mass extinction and after it even though there were a lot of dinosaurs on the other side of it. But Massospondylus is one of them. We also have a huge data set of Massospondylus. There are over 200 specimens known in South Africa alone. But for a while, it was a wastebasket taxon. So there's a little bit of speculation that those might not all be valid. So they went and looked at all of them, <laughs> basically, and proposed a neotype in 2019 because the holotype could use an update. And what they found was that most of the individuals were, in fact, massospondylus. They matched enough to be considered the same species. That's it, good. Yeah, and that included the embryos. Yeah, a nice sample set. It is. I thought you'd be excited because they're baby sauropods. Yeah. One big question about massospondylus for a while has been, was it quadrupedal while it was young? Because there's been a hypothesis that maybe it walked on all fours, and then as it grew up, it became bipedal. Most people are pretty confident that it was, in fact, bipedal as an adult. But could this quadrupedality have been a juvenile characteristic that later dinosaurs, which were quadrupedal, held onto? And that process is called pedomorphic retention, where a, a distant descendant latches on to this ancestor's juvenile state. We, I think we've talked about it a little bit before with teeth. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting concept. Yeah, super weird. It kind of makes sense because it's in the DNA already. It's something that the organism has been capable of. So maybe you could turn on a gene and get back to it. One example of this is in Musaurus. We see that it shifts from quadrupedal to bipedal, just like humans. And there was actually a really fun chart they had with their principal components on it. And it showed... Basically, you have three groups. You've got the group that's bipedal, and it's a line with one slope. You've got a group that's quadrupedal, and it has a different slope and in a different spot. And then you've got the line that switches from quadrupedal to bipedal, and it goes, it connects the two lines. Basically, it moves over, and you can see that transition from quadrupedal to bipedal mathematically. And both Musaurus and humans line up exactly the same. It's like the exact same transition going from quadrupedal as babies into bipedal as adults, because that is in fact what we do. We are quadrupedal <laughs> when we are born and later we learn to walk on two feet. <laughs> so there are some cute little sauropods kind of going through the same thing. Yep. Massospondylus, 
on the other hand, appears to be strictly bipedal. Looking at those charts, it, it lines up very well with all the bipedal animals, and therefore, it was probably bipedal its whole life. There were a couple of other supporting facts there. The inner ear geometry and the size of the inner ear also look like the posture doesn't change. The hind limb and forelimb also grew similarly. And another thing they look at is the lags between the humerus and the femur. What you'd expect to see if it was shifting from quadrupedal to bipedal is that at first the arms and the legs were growing about the same size because they're quadrupedal, so they both need to bulk up. But as it shifted to bipedal, the arms might grow a little bit less quickly because the legs are the ones that need to bulk up. However, what they found was that these results were all over the place. I think we reported once that it looked like the arms were developing a little bit slower or the legs were developing faster. But it turns out there's a ton of that developmental plasticity that we talked about before, which is basically they come in a million different varieties. Some of them, the arms grew really fast and the legs grew slow. Some of them, the legs grew faster and slower and it's just every possible combination. So if you looked at just that in a couple of individuals, you get a really misleading view on how they developed. But since we have such a huge sample size, we can see that it's just all over the place. Kind of like the owl source. Exactly. Interestingly, they think that crazy plasticity of growing at different rates and all these adaptable potentially abilities might have been how it survived the Triassic Jurassic boundary when there was a huge shift in the ecological niches. If some of them were growing in different ways, maybe they could take advantage of that new situation and didn't go extinct. Keeping the uh, extinction event on its toes, I guess. Yep. And they got to stay around because otherwise we wouldn't have brontosaurus. <laughs> You need those early sauropodomorphs to make it through the Triassic Jurassic boundary. True. Not necessarily Massospondylus specifically, though. I should also mention they looked at Rapetosaurus, which has also been considered potentially shifting, and they found it was strictly quadrupedal, in case you're keeping track. So, per usual, dinosaurs are all over the place. Yep. That's how we like them. Mm -hmm. Like Pokemon. Lots of variability. Next up was another clarity talk. This one was by Chris Griffin. It was mostly about birds, so I'm only going to talk very briefly about it. But what they did was they were watching bird embryos and basically what their skeletons look like as they develop in the egg. And what they found was that in the early stages of development, they're very dinosaur looking. They have a long tail and they have a hip arrangement that looks like a dinosaur. But later on, through the course of the embryo developing, it shifts into a much shorter tail which you'd expect because that's what birds eventually have, and the bird hip arrangement. And we can actually track that because of the magic of clarity and see the exact details of how it shifts over time. And it's just a really cool talk because it's so fun to see these these changes happen in like a clear Mm -hmm. embryo. It's just, ah, man, I love clarity. That's why it's the fun fact. (laughs) It is, yeah. Another talk with some dinosaur implications was by Caleb Sellers, And they were looking at how bite forces affect the shape of a skull or maybe how the shape of the skull affects a bite force. What they found was that animals with really high bite forces usually have high skulls to match and that allows for more muscle space and attachment points. Like a T-Rex skull. Exactly. Compared to something like a salamander or something with a much flatter skull. Weirdly though, I think the animals with the strongest bite force right now are crocodiles, the Mm. strongest living animals, and they have really flat skulls, so they completely break the trend (laughs) and just fly in the face of all logic. But they have that neck muscle. They do. So basically in the Q&A, someone asked, you know, how do they compensate for this crazy flat skull but really high bite force and the answer is the bulges on the side of a crocodile's head which look like a big fat neck are actually massive muscles and if you look carefully at a crocodile while it's basking you can sometimes see its whole neck twitching just like a muscle twitch if you've ever seen like a bodybuilder flex all sorts of individual muscles around their body you see the same kind of thing. Don't mistake it for fat. Yeah. It was, I've always thought that these were just overfed crocodiles in zoos or, you know, you, sometimes you see them on the banks like we saw them in Thailand, these massive crocodiles. But 
it turns out they're not overfed. That's not fat. That's a huge chunk of muscle waiting to slam those jaws shut in crazy amounts of force. And it might be an inefficient placement for those muscles, but they're big enough that it doesn't matter. Basically, they they found a way, as we say. It used to be they say, now we say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they said it earlier and then we said it, now we say it. I see. Yeah. But no matter what, you need to avoid crocodiles. They have very strong jaws and they will mess you up if you get too close to them. Mm. And they can move really quickly too. That's another important detail. They can run pretty fast. I'm just going to mention one more crocodilian paper because I think it's semi-relevant. This one was by Zachary Morris and it was about, again, the heads of crocodilians. Specifically focusing on gharials, they have that really weird feature where their head gets really long and narrow and as they grow, they even get longer and narrower, which is pretty weird, but it's because they're specialized to eat fish. Interestingly, once gharials reach a certain size, certain species that are the largest gharials actually have wider skulls again. So they got longer and longer and narrower and narrower. And then at a certain point, they start getting wider again. And the hypothesis here is that they do that because they can't survive on fish alone. So they had to evolve wider heads so they can get different prey and that narrow specialized jaw, which is only good for eating fish, didn't suit them anymore. So they need a little more regular crocodile, triangular type head. Makes me wonder with Spinosaurus where it fit on that specialization spectrum. Yeah, that's a good point. We need a lot of Spinosaurus skulls, I think. Yeah. It does seem that Spinosaurus ate a lot of fish and it had some huge fish to eat. So it's possible that it could survive on fish alone. Yeah. But Spinosaurids, not Spinosaurus, close relatives have been found with pteranodons or iguanodons or other things in their bellies. True. Yeah. I mean, I wonder, I'm not sure, gharials might occasionally have other stuff in their bellies too, if they happen upon it when it's already dead. Because even if their jaws aren't ideal for eating it, if it's just laying there, yeah, you could probably make Easy it Easy meal. Yeah. And speaking of easy meals, Ryuji Takasaki had a talk about gizzards and how they might be evidence for herbivory, or maybe not, because even though gastrolists are usually considered evidence for eating plants, they're also present in lots of carnivores. So maybe when we see gizzard stones, we should not be assuming they were herbivores. It comes up a lot when we're talking about various dinosaurs and trying to figure out what they ate. Mm Mm-hmm. Takazaki looked at a lot of different gizzard stones and compared them to diet and found that gastrolists do tend to get eroded more in herbivores, which means they might be being used more severely, as he put it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, maybe gizzard stones are more necessary for a tough, fibrous diet, but not all gizzards are the same. And dinosaurs with the strongest or thickest gizzards are the ones that are likely to include herbivores. But theropods also have some good uses for gizzards as well. It's pretty weird to think about. Yeah. Especially if they are edentulous, because we think that there were some predatory dinosaurs that didn't have teeth. Gastrolus can be really useful for helping to digest food. They can help mix things around, and they can also break apart things like bones, I suppose, if they're strong enough. Sauropods and ornithischians that do some oral processing still have gastrolis, and it might be because they wanted to mix up their stomach contents and help with digestion, but not necessarily because they are eating plants. It's also possible that we might be able to see dietary shifts using gizzard stones because it turns out that chicks, meaning baby chickens, might select different gastrolis depending on their diet. And they change pretty quickly once they're in the stomach. Apparently, it only takes about a week for gastrolists that are selected that are pretty sharp to smooth out. And then they get excreted after just a few months in their digestive system. So gastrolists aren't the kind of thing. It's not like that urban legend where you swallow a piece of gum and it stays in your stomach for 10 years or whatever. Seven years. (laughs) Yeah. Gastrolists also don't do that. You swallow them and they get passed within a few months at the longest. So 
we shouldn't think of them as a permanent indicator in the gut. It could just show some seasonal variability because when you're looking at a fossil, it's just a snapshot in time. Maybe they were just trying it out. Yeah. They also interestingly gave a tip for if you're going to buy or collect gastroliths. I don't know if it was intended to be that way, but they pointed out that gastroliths in air quotes that are sold in stores are usually way too polished. And gastroliths look, if they're real, like the surface is really rough and acid etched and kind of messed up. They're kind of rounded, but they're not polished by any means. So don't get hoodwinked by these fake gastrolith salespeople. I don't think I've ever seen gastrolith for sale, but... I can't <laughs> recall any times, yeah. It doesn't seem like something there'd be a big market for. It seems like if you're going to fake something, you might as well fake a tooth or fake a claw or something. And last up for the Romer Prize, I'm going to talk about the Romer Prize winner, saving the best for last. Not necessarily in my opinion, but in the opinion of the Romer Prize officiating committee. So... <laughs> It was still a good talk. <laughs> it was a good one. They used a model I haven't ever seen before. It's called a general circulation model, and the full name is HAD CM3L. Basically, it's a climate model, which is very similar to modern weather forecasting technology. It uses a system called ecological niche modeling, and it combines that with fossil data to predict which climates an organism can best live in. So it's sort of the equivalent of if you're looking at a bunch of climate data from around the world right now and trying to pick where you'd want to live or where you think different species could live based on the climate. If you did that, I wonder if you, without being a human or knowing humans, if you'd be able to predict that humans can live in all climates. We are oddballs for sure because <laughs> we're hairless and yet we live in very cold places. You'd think we would all be in Africa and, you know, near the equator. Because, yeah, we don't we don't look like we'd be good in the cold for sure. <laughs> I don't think we'd be good in extreme heat either. Well, we're okay, right? I mean, at least some of us, I don't, but some of us have enough melanin in our skin that we don't get burned and we can sweat. Yeah, that's true. I, but sometimes it's so hot that you don't sweat. Uh, well, as long as you're getting enough water. You would probably not expect to find us in the desert, which is where some people live. But, yeah. As long as we had enough access to food and water, we should be able to survive in hot environments. But yeah, I think cold environments, you wouldn't guess if you were an alien using this model for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you found our clothes, then you might be confused. And tools, yeah. Yeah. But going back to the dinosaurs, this talk, the point of it was not so much what kind of model they were using. It was more testing the difference between a Chicxulub impact versus a Deccan volcanic eruption at the end of the Cretaceous to see which one would have made life less hospitable for dinosaurs. So overall, Cretaceous North America actually had more space available for dinosaurs to live in than the time immediately preceding it, like the mid-Cretaceous. Part of that is the western interior seaway shrank away, so there was more land available for dinosaurs to live on. The most interesting thing by far to me about this was that with the Deccan traps, they tested a climate model with four times the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, and it actually increased the habitable area for dinosaurs, which I think proves my point that if we emit a crazy amount of carbon dioxide and wipe ourselves out, the dinosaurs are going to re-inherit the earth because... <laughs> The avian ones. Yes, exactly. Because clearly they are well suited to that environment. They also found that this volcanic eruption from the Deccan Traps would have reduced the recovery time after the KPG boundary from about 30 years from the Chicxulub impact alone to about 10 years. So far from the previously held hypothesis that the Deccan Traps combined with the Chicxulub impactor to make a super storm, you know, a, a combination of negative effects that wiped out the dinosaurs. It turns out that if the Deccan traps were releasing a bunch of carbon dioxide, they actually would have helped the dinosaurs survive the KPG boundary. So not only is the Chicxulub impact the most likely cause for the dinosaurs going extinct, it doesn't look like the Deccan traps would have made the dinosaurs go extinct at all, period. It's interesting to think how our viewpoints have changed in just a few decades. Yeah. Yeah, I remember as a kid having 
a poster on my wall with volcanoes <laughs> on it as the most likely way of wiping out the dinosaurs. But maybe not the case. I mean, this is mostly looking at CO2. So if the Deccan traps were releasing a ton of soot, you know, that might change things a little bit. But they did point out, in case you're wondering, that a 10% solar dimming is all that was required to essentially make the entire planet inhabitable for dinosaurs, which basically means all the land is below freezing. 10% solar dimming. Not really that much of a dimming. It's not much of a dimming? I don't know. Like, if you go outside on a cloudy day, it's more than 10% dimmer. Mm. But this is talking over a really long period of time, and it's in the upper atmosphere, so it's also reflecting a lot more spectrum than clouds do, and for a decade or three. Sounds like a rough time. Yeah. Glad we weren't there. Me too. But I'm glad it happened, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. True. There are also some cool dinosaur toxin posters in the taphonomy and stratigraphy session of SVP. So one of them was a poster by Bethania Sevier and others, and it talked about how there's a lot of confusion around when you find lesions on bone, and you need to consider the context. It's not just all from tooth traces. So what they did is they looked at 3,013 Edmontosaurus bones from a bone bed in the Lance Formation, and they analyzed those lesions. That is a lot of bones, over 3,000? Holy cow. I didn't even know we had that many Edmontosaurus bones. Yeah, I didn't either. Although, thinking about it now, I'm not that surprised. The cows of the Cretaceous mm-hmm. and all. <laughs> yep. So they found that not all the lesions on the bone were from tooth traces, 25 were putative lytic lesions, so they came from cancer. 15 had perimortem tooth trace features, so they happened around the time of death, and that was based on gross appearance. And of those 15, three were from other causes, including infection and joint disease, or it could have been insect damage. Of the bones that did have clear tooth traces, they likely came from T-Rex, but there's only Ichnotaxa around, so we don't know for sure. But it is interesting. Usually you think, oh yeah, something bit it. That's why there's that mark, but it could be a lot of other things. Stephen Gatesy and others talked about how sometimes looking at dinosaur tracks can be misleading in terms of how big that foot was actually <laughs> in real life. So the gist is that there's these penetrative tracks. So like a sauropod steps in soft mud and then the foot goes in several layers and that when you look at just the track, the track looks a little bit narrow, but it could just be because the foot went in and out of the ground. It kind of sank in and made it look more narrow. So you're looking at the exit track rather than the full depth of the track? What they did was they made models to show how tracks looked going into substrate, and then they put a grid on the substrate so that they could track the tracks. And the first model was... Track the tracks. Yeah. And the first model was just wire toes going in. And that looked as they expected it to look, that narrow look. Then they gave it thicker toes. And those tracks looked like tracks from the early Jurassic. There were some deformations of the grid that was on the substrate. Then they made it an anatomical foot with toe pads. And that went into the substrate. And then all the proportions changed. And even though you've got this foot that you know is fairly wide, the track looked much more narrow. They found that the motion of the foot mattered too in terms of how the substrate went around the foot and then make, made the track ultimately look like it came from a smaller foot. They did this also with a guinea fowl foot and they found similarities. Basically a chicken walking in mud. Yes. <laughs> and that also showed them that the gaps in toes matter in terms of how the substrate flows. So there's a lot of different details that you have to take into consideration for tracks. Yeah, I think we've talked about this in earlier SVP talks and other papers too, where basically when things are walking in soft mud, you get all sorts of weird deformations and it makes it a lot harder to tell what the foot looks like. But if you can look at it in a 3D context, like you can scan it or you slice through it, then you can see how the toes are moving through the substrate. You can get a little bit more detail about what it looks like than if you just look at the superficial exit print, basically, mm-hmm. because it it's like when you're walking in mud, if it's deep enough, you'll just kind of have that exit hole of your leg <laughs> where you pull your foot out of 
and you'd think that it was some hoofed animal that walked there because you just see a hole in the ground. You wouldn't know that there was a human foot that sunk into it and pulled its way back out of it. Right. And I guess the same goes for dinosaurs. Have you ever lost a shoe like that? No, but I've seen videos like that. Oh, I've lost lots of shoes. (laughs) <laughs> because I, I walked in mud more as a kid than you did. I guess so. <laughs> it's really annoying because then you you always take the next step like because you're getting off balance from pulling your foot out and then you get your sock all muddy. Then you got to stick it back in the mud hole to get the shoe out. Were you always able to get your shoe back? Yeah. <laughs> I think actually now that I'm thinking about it, it might have been more in snow. We had these snow boots that were like galoshes with a liner basically and the liner would pull out. And then, yeah, there's a problem. Mm, I could see that happening. You grew up in the Midwest, so. Mm -hmm. And there's one other talk in the taphonomy and stratigraphy session with William Framuth and others. And they went to the Egg Mountain locality in Montana and looked at regurgitolites. And regurgitolites are food that was swallowed and then spit out. Yeah, so maybe it's bones or hair. (laughs) feathers or something that they'd rather cough out than try to digest could be or it could be how like birds feed their chicks oh yeah i suppose so they looked at these regurgitolites that had they call them mammal bearing regurgitolites and there were features of these regurgitolites that were similar to diurnal raptors in terms of how it was digested and broken down so they think that it came from troodon or a dromaeosaurid And they actually think it most likely came from Troodon because there's shed teeth at the locality and other evidence. Assuming that you think Troodon is, in fact, its own genus and not Sauronothelestes? There were a lot of people hinting that there would be more evidence for Troodon coming out in the coming weeks. And I think that paper might be out now. Oh, no. We're falling behind because of all the SVP talks. Yeah. (laughs) So if it is Troodon... This might show that Troodon went after small prey, small mammals, in other words. And now moving on to the education and outreach session. There were a lot of really great talks, but I'm just going to focus on the ones that were more dinosaur heavy. So first up was Alex Hastings talked about uh, interactive dinosaur lessons to teach anatomy and body size. And it seems like a really fun extension of his classes and his outreach about dinosaurs in comic books. So they had exercises like learning the sauropod tail posture, and you test a model of two sauropod caudal vertebrae, and you see how they move laterally. There's one also on theropod forelimb posture, where one person wears crocheted gloves that had three fingers, and then someone else holds a dinosaur tail attached to a stiff board. And if you're the person with the gloves, you're the predator, and the person with the board is the prey. (laughs) And the predator, as the predator, you have to try and catch the prey either using a palms down or palms in technique. And you'll find that the palms in technique is the one that works. Gotcha. Because otherwise you're just kind of pressing down on it and not grabbing it at all. Yeah. Interesting. They also had a lesson on body size. So they printed a banner of a life-size diagram of a T-Rex skull, of Sue's skull. And then people were able to compare their own head (laughs) and body, basically, to Sue's head. So they found that these interactive fun lessons were simple and effective and that they worked for all ages, adults and kids. And one of the phrases they were talking about was clappers, not slappers, in terms of, you know, the palms down or palms in technique. And in the Q&A talk that they had, uh, someone else said that they teach early childhood and they love to talk about pronation and they always say dinosaurs couldn't play piano. Yeah, <laughs> only symbols. <laughs> yeah. I like the comparison to T-Rex's skull. That's a real quick way to feel massively inferior looking at your own head compared to a T-Rex head. Mm -hmm. They got teeth that are like the size of our head. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. (laughs) Christopher Griffin had a poster on using student-driven experiential learning to teach they call it hypothesis-based fieldwork at a university. So it's it's basically doing critical thinking to figure out how do you know where to dig as a paleontologist. And it's really hard to do this kind of lesson in classes with more than 100 students, but yeah. he found a way. Wow. So they did it with this activity where you split the class into teams of eight and you tell them, okay, you're vertebrate paleontologists and you want to discover new fossils of the oldest dinosaurs from around 230 million years ago. 
and you need to determine a new place to look for these early dinosaurs where none have been found before, and you're trying to get funds from National Geographic, so you have to be convincing. Oh, is that all? <laughs> but they give you some information, some information sheets on like rock formations, fossils, a map of Pangaea with an explanation of latitudinal climatic zones, and then you work through a series of questions so you figure out like which environments are unlikely to preserve dinosaur fossils. So a marine paleo environment, you can rule those out. Uh, how old are the oldest close dinosaur relatives would be middle Triassic. So you figure out which formations you want to look at that are the right age for the oldest dinosaurs. And then eventually you narrow it down and figure out where you want to dig. And really, in real life, it's not so much where you want to dig because you don't just randomly dig. It's more like where you want to look on the surface for a bone and then you find the bone and that's where you start digging. Yeah, which might be what they did. Um, just simplifying. Probably, yeah. Because if you're going to convince National Geographic, probably need to be more precise. <laughs> I suppose, yeah. But you would probably emphasize that you're going to need to do some digging because that's the expensive part. True. Well, it depends where in the world you're going to also. You have to get there. Yeah, like we keep seeing, even at SVP this year, there were a bunch of talks showing Mongolia and just how difficult it is to get out there in a car or really in anything and get fossils back out because there are not a lot of paved roads. I think there's two paved roads in the country. So you got to really have some skills unique to the area if you want to try to get dinosaurs there. Definitely. A lot of resources. You know, it's easier to do, though. Check out an AR app. That does sound easier. Which is what a few of the posters were on. So Laura Viotti and Tyler Kerr created, they called it Wyo Fossil App, and that was to make the University of Wyoming Geological Museum fossil collections more accessible. And it's an AR app. It superimposes their 3D models of fossil specimens on cards. And right now there's only five cards available. That was because they didn't want the app to be too large because the models have a lot of data. Yeah, I've downloaded a couple, say like an ankylosaurus head. You can download the holotype. I think that alone is about 80 megabytes. It's mm -hmm. very detailed, but yeah, they can, they can add up quickly. Yes. So they picked uh, one fossil specimen per geological period that was common or unique to Wyoming and highlights what's in the museum and the collections. And they developed it using Unity and Vuforia, and they published it to iOS. And on the dinosaur side, they had Allosaurus fragilis representing from the Jurassic. And the cards that they have, they're kind of like these trading card style with more information about each fossil. Cool. Yeah. And they said their next steps are to make a cloud-based so that they can add more models. So that's just stored in the RAM. You don't have to download all of it permanently. Mm-hmm. But they weren't the only AR apps. So there's other really great AR apps. There were people talking about different methods of teaching, depending on the learner and how they best learn, different ways of promoting critical thinking via data and science, a lot of interactive sessions and then adapting things online due to COVID, and a lot of really great discussion on how to support more minorities in STEM and plug the leaky pipeline. There's some suggestions included reaching out to universities with diversity offices and going to sources working at the state and national level. Nice. Yeah. So it was an interesting session, great Q&A, and I always find the education and outreach sessions really interesting. Yep. That's why you're on that beat. <laughs> I did hear a little bit of it, and it did sound very good. Mm -hmm. And that's all we've got for SVP this week. We'll be wrapping it up next episode. And in other dinosaur news, just real quick, the first complete Triceratops skull found in Colorado is now at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science for the next 12 months because it's going to be studied and prepared there. And it was found in Weld County in 1982 and donated by landowner Roland Sonny Mapoli in 1986 to the county. And the skull, it's got a great nickname. It's Pops. Pops the Triceratops. <laughs> Pops the Triceratops. Yeah. pops -a tops <laughs> And last, the Natural History Museum of Utah opened a new exhibit, Antarctic Dinosaurs, which is open from now until April 4th of 2021. And they've got fossils of Cryolophosaurus and interactive displays of how paleontologists excavated fossils in Antarctica I think this is a traveling exhibit that we've talked about before. But yeah, I think this is not the first time. Yeah, but now it's in Utah. And if you're going, you do need to make a reservation. I do love the fact that we somehow managed to get to Antarctica and find dinosaurs there. Mm -hmm. That is 
amazing. And everybody who's worked there is very impressive. Speaking of difficult places to get to. <laughs> Seriously. Makes Mongolia look like a cakewalk. <laughs> and now onto our dinosaur of the day, Hypsilosaurus, which was a request from Ricardo via Patreon and Discord. So thanks. Hypsilosaurus was a titanosaur sauropod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now southern France. And originally it was thought to be 49 feet or 15 meters long, but now it's estimated to be 39.4 feet or 12 meters long and weigh 7.3 to 14 and a half tons. That's not much of a titanosaur under 40 feet. Well, it's also a dubious genus. Uh oh. <laughs> so Hypsilosaurus was first described in 1846, but it wasn't named until 1869. And it was named by Philip Matheron as Hypsilosaurus priscus. The genus name means highest lizard. Originally, Matheron thought that Hypsilosaurus was an aquatic crocodile. <laughs> he said that the femur didn't have medullary bones, so it could not have lived on land like Iguanodon. That's one piece of evidence, I guess. Right. Well, this is at a time where not many dinosaur fossils were known. It'd be a large crocodile. Again, 1800s. <laughs> Dinosaurs were a new field of study. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, the holotype includes a partial hind limb and two caudal vertebrae, and two eggshell fragments were found by the fossils. Pierre, Philippe, Emile Matheron described the bones from Provence, France in 1846, and then formally described them in 1869, and several specimens have been referred to Hypsilosaurus. Albert de la Perrin described a caudal vertebra in 1957, and Bataler described a vertebra in 1960. In 1993, however, a review of sauropods in Europe found Hypsilosaurus to be a nomum dubium because the holotype didn't have distinguishing characteristics from other sauropods in the region, and other regions as well. And that would make the Hypsilosaurus material to be an intermediate titanosaur of some sort. The two eggshell fragments that were found near it were spherical or ellipsoid, and Matherin proposed that they were either from a large bird egg or from Hypsilosaurus, which, again, at the time he thought was a crocodile. These eggs were about one foot or 30 centimeters long, so they're large. They may not be Hypsilosaurus. Yeah, being found near it is not always the best way to go about it, as we know from Oviraptor. Well, actually, in that case, it would have worked out better for Oviraptor because we thought it was eating it. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Learning about these eggs led me down my own rabbit hole, or oh, Erictodromius hole. You're going down rabbit holes now. Burrow, yeah. And it's about dinosaur eggs. So the first dinosaur eggs that we know about were found in 1859 by Jean-Jacques Pouche, a priest who also explored geology and paleontology in the Pyrenees Mountains. And he wrote, The most remarkable are eggshell fragments of great dimensions. At first, I thought they could be integumentary plates of reptiles, but their constant thickness between two perfectly parallel surfaces, their fiber structure normal to the surfaces, and especially their regular curvature definitely suggest that they are enormous eggshells, at least four times the volume of ostrich eggs. Sounds like a dinosaur egg to me. <laughs> yeah. So he thought they were from a large bird. The term dinosaur, though, was not well known at the time. And dinosaur eggshells hadn't been found before. It is funny how often that came up, like dinosaur tracks were originally thought to be large bird tracks, dinosaur eggshells were originally thought to be large bird eggshells, and then everyone thought they were all from dinosaurs without connecting the dots that maybe dinosaurs are in fact related to birds. Except for Huxley. That's true. Yeah, a couple people did figure it out. <laughs> so this is the first dinosaur eggs that we know about, found in 1859, then 1869, the Perhaps Hypsilosaurus eggshells were found, and Matheron again thought they could be from a giant bird or a Hypsilosaur, which at the time he thought to be a large crocodile. In 1877, Paul Gervais compared the microstructure of those eggshell fragments with those of different birds, tortoises, crocodiles, and geckos to figure out what had laid these eggs. And he thought they matched tortoises and said we couldn't know if the eggshells were from a dinosaur, quote, because we completely do not know the characteristics of the dinosaur's egg, end quote. If only there was some modern living animal that was related to <laughs> such prehistoric beasts. <laughs> it's early days. <laughs> so 
1923, Roy Chapman Andrews from the American Museum of Natural History found dinosaur eggs in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, and that got a lot more attention than the eggshell fragments that were found in France. And I think for a while there was a mix-up. People thought that the first dinosaur eggs were found in 1923, when in fact they'd been found in the 1850s. Yeah, like 70 years earlier. Mm. But that led to the existence of dinosaur eggs being accepted. So then the fragments found in France were reinterpreted to be dinosaur eggs. Then shortly after, amateur geologist Maurice Deragnat collected eggshell fragments in France near Velo and Rognac. Victor von Strahlen studied their microstructure and attributed them to hypsellosaurs. More eggs were found in France in the 1930s, and then in 1947, Albert de Laparant said the eggs found in that area were all from Hypsellosaurus priscus. But different types of eggshells have been attributed to Hypsellosaurus. Some of them had very thin shells, and that was thought maybe it's because of changes in vegetation or climate, or there was overcrowding and that led to stress, or maybe these were laid by younger individuals, or maybe they were laid by a different taxa. And now it's thought it's most likely that they were laid by different taxa. Well, they definitely weren't from Hypsellosaurus because there is no such thing as Hypsellosaurus anymore. Oh, right. Because it's dubious. <laughs> so other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include Dromaeosaurids, Varoraptor, and Pyroraptor, Ornithopod, Rhabdodon, and Ankylosaur, Rhodanosaurus. All possible contenders for the layer of that egg. Yeah, but it's very hard to match a dinosaur to an egg unless you find the embryo. Very true. I mean, I guess you can know a little bit by size, so it's probably not a Dromaeosaurid. In another tangent, I think Pyroraptor is one of the new dinosaurs in Jurassic World Dominion. Oh, cool. I know it's been featured pretty heavily in some of the games, so that makes sense. Maybe they'll put feathers on it. I'm not holding my breath, but I hope so. Feathers, please. <laughs> It's at least in Jurassic World Alive. Yeah, it has feathers in that game, too. It could happen. We could live to see the day that there are, is a real fluffy dinosaur in Jurassic World. That would be great. And as promised, our fun fact of the day is going to go into what clarity is and what does it stand for, both literally and figuratively. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so clarity was developed by neuroscientists. And as far as I can find, they first published about it in 2013. So this is less than 10 years old from the very first paper of the technique at all. It's very new science. The process basically boils down to two steps. You want to dissolve the opaque fatty tissue in the brain. And specifically, it was the brain in the early studies because they were neuroscientists. So that's what they wanted to see while at the same time replacing the tissue that you're dissolving with a hydrogel that maintains the structure. Very fancy technique. Because the hydrogel is clear, this allows you to turn what would normally be, say, a pink opaque brain into a completely clear brain where you can see all the details inside it, especially if you use the technique of immunofluorescence to light up different areas under UV radiation. So you can essentially stain the neurons with immunofluorescence and then see the exact pattern of neurons in like a rat brain, which is just amazing and obviously incredibly useful for neuroscientists. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty groundbreaking for their research. It's been used quite a bit by neuroscientists already. There's lots of papers about it. There was a huge surge in 2013 and 2014 of research on it. And ideally, what they're looking for is human treatments. So they want to look at samples of human brains and look for connections to something like depression or anxiety. Maybe you could see some literal connections of neurons in the brain that are linked to these issues and then find treatments that might, you know, reduce the intensity of that connection and thereby alleviate some of the suffering that people go through. But as we pointed out, you can also use it with dinosaurs <laughs> because any tissue which is the right type of lipid can be replaced with a hydrogel by using this technique. And then, as we talked about with Alita Bayuel in the past, you can use that immunofluorescence to attach 
fluorescent molecules to all sorts of different organic material. And then you shine a light on it and you can light up all sorts of different structures, different colors. It doesn't just have to be limited to neurons. It's awesome. Clarity is kind of an acronym. It took me a really long time to find out what Clarity stood for. It's not in the earliest papers that I was looking at. They always just call it Clarity in all caps. And I think it's because the acronym is kind of bad. (laughs) But I did find on Clearlight Biotechnologies website a definition of the acronym. They say Clarity stands for Clear Lipid Exchanged Acrylamide Hybridized Rigid Imaging Tissue Hydrogel. That's a mouthful. It is. And if you are paying attention, it seems like there should be an H in the middle and an H at the end. And those do not exist in Clarity. And that's because they have the C is for clear. The L is for lipid exchanged. Hmm. The A is for acrylamide hybridized, hyphenated. Mm -hmm. The R is for rigid. The I is for imaging. The T is for tissue. And the Y is for hydrogel because they just ignore the fact that it starts with an H. Hydrogel. Yeah, exactly. They just capitalize the Y in hydrogel. The I sometimes also, rather than being imaging, is immunostaining, referring to what I was talking about with the immunofluorescence, or in situ hybridization compatible. I think someone just really wanted the acronym to be Clarity. It is a fantastic acronym, so I appreciate the effort, but they had to have hydrogel in there because that's the main feature of it. And hydrogel starts with an H, so I guess they just made it a Y. Mm. It was better than Clary, Clarith. Clarith, yeah. <laughs> There's another acronym that has been derived from Clarity, which is if you combine Clarity optimized light sheet as one thing, microscopy, you get Colm, not as catchy. Mm-mm. So a lot of times they call it Clarity Colm. And if you do that structure of optimized light sheet microscopy, it makes it easier to image. So that's a common technique they use. I think that was developed maybe even in 2014, shortly after the original Clarity stuff came up. But it's amazing. I'm really excited to see how we use this on basically all we can use it on is birds because we don't have dinosaurs that are developing that have lipid tissue we can replace with hydrogels so it's not going to be useful in dinosaur fossils themselves at least for now you gotta get dinosaurs from jurassic world yeah exactly or but we can use it with crocodilians we can use it with birds and things like that and sort of piece together some details about dinosaurs cool yeah i think it's awesome it's even fun just to see the non-dinosaur related stuff like the neuroscience uses because seeing neurons in a real brain is pretty amazing And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our community, patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time.